Hello and welcome everybody to the last of, our, of this year's um, EHU19 seminar series. Um, this um, seminar series is called Wollstonecraft's Breasts uh, and it's going to be a conversation between me and Kayla Probian from um, Ohio State University. Uh, we met uh, last year at NASA in Texas um, and I was very relieved to hear someone talking about Wordsworth at the airport. So I knew that I was in um, the right place. And uh, we sort of kept on um, talking, discussing um, over the course of that conference. Kayla did a brilliant paper about breastfeeding in uh, Anne Yearsley's um, writing. Uh, and that is coming out in European Romantic Review soon. So hopefully your um, interest will be whetted by our conversation um, today about breastfeeding and uh, Wollstonecraft writing, but also breastfeeding in, in the Romantic period more generally, and you'll be able to read um, uh, the, the the outcome of, of some of these discussions in the in the near future, right, Kayla? Yeah. It's coming like summer, summertime. Yes, that's Basically. what I hear. That's super exciting. So would you, like, we... Some of you will remember back in our um, first seminar series, we started thinking about Mary Hamilton and um, a, a sort of a big digital project about her life and writing. And we began with a very simple question, which was, who was Mary Hamilton? And I thought I'd steal that for uh, this presentation with her, who was, who was Mary Wollstonecraft. So you've got some slides that, you could, that we've checked that you can share. Yes. Uh, we we'll, we'll we'll start with we'll start there with like okay. a little bit of over to you and then we'll have a chat and then hopefully questions will flood in. Okay, all right. Let me share. Uh, okay, can you all see? This? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, then yeah, thank you for that introduction. Um, who is Mary Wollstonecraft? I just put a couple uh, of like the you know overarching big picture stuff on the slide for us to think about and then you know Andy and I can talk in a little bit more detail um but she was born in 1759 and died in 1797 um she worked as a teacher a governess a translator a writer she had a, a famous uh famously tumultuous relationship with uh, American Gilbert Imlay and had a daughter with him named Fanny um and later she married the philosopher William Godwin and had a daughter who born uh named Mary who would become Mary Shelley and write Frankenstein um, and as you can see, she published quite a bit in her relatively short life. Um, she published Thoughts on Education of Daughters, Mary of Fiction, Vindication of the Rights of Woman, uh, a, a funky uh, travelogue kind of called Letters Written During a Short Residence in Sweden, Norway, and Denmark, and Mariah or the Wrongs of Woman. Um, and as you can see, she published quite a bit about women's rights and education. And she was really interested in, I think, the term most used when, when we think about Wollstonecraft is like an unsexed moral education. Um, and I want to like, I want Andy to like fill in some of the, the exciting details. Like what are your favorite Wollstonecraft anecdotes? Because there's so many, I, I, like they could not all fit on the slides. I wonder if you could tell us like two or three. Oh, wow. You're putting, you're putting me on the spot already. Um, yeah, yeah. I like, um, so she had a really interesting relationship with her publisher, Joseph Johnson, who's like an interesting um, guy in his own uh, right. He was one of the leading uh, radical publishers um, in in London at the time and was later like in, sort of in, tr in trouble due, due to sort of pro-revolutionary um, publications that, he, that, that he came up with. But as she was writing A Vindication of the Rights of Woman, she would she would be she was sort of talking to him. Um, in in the write up in 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 during the writing process, and I think he, she went to him at one point and said she just couldn't she couldn't do it anymore. And in a brilliant bit of reverse psychology, Joseph Johnson was like, "Oh, that's okay. You don't have to do this." And then she sort of came, then she sort of like came up with the rest of the uh, the business. So I think they were they were essentially sort of printing printing out the book as she was sort of giving him um, mm -hmm. pages to to sort of to to typeset. So they had this sort of really like and it, like I think it was a really energizing relationship for her that that he he sort of knew how to prod her into action. So you get this um a vindication of the rights of women, which is almost her yeah, it's almost her like stream of consciousness responses to the to 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 thoughts about women's education and women's rights in the context of the French Revolution that that's being published 
that's being sort of printed as she's thinking it, which is a sort of really interesting way of thinking about that that text, which is a sort of you know an important text of of feminist political activism. Mm -hmm. That's one of that's one of my fa favorite anecdotes. What's what is one of your favorite Wollstonecraft anecdotes? I mean, I I've heard a lot of like uh, just interesting things. It's not really as interesting as what you're saying, but one of my favorites is like about the way that she dressed. That she sort of refused to wear, um, like, you know, quote unquote, fancy class uh, dress, uh, like according to like a higher class. She liked to dress very, very plain and simply, um, and did not like draw attention to like she didn't sexualize herself uh, in dress. I guess is the way to sum it up. Um, and I know like today that we can see that as having very um like not like other girl vibes. <laughs> I don't think that was her intention though. I think she just was really clear about, you know, uh, what are the things that are important to her? Uh, not to like, yeah, romanticize that. But yeah, the, just that she wanted so far to separate herself from, um, you know, what was standard and what was typical and live according to what she thought was important. She says she she writes that to her to her sisters, doesn't she? There's a famous line where she says, I, "I'm I'm going to be first of a new genus." Mm -hmm, she, mm -hmm. she, I I think she she has a little bit of uh, not like not like other girls. Right? <laughs> she, she wants to. She she sort of thought of herself as this sort of very distinctive personality, mm -hmm. and that's like mm -hmm. part of her presentation. I think. Yeah, well, and I love first of a new genus is like not like other girls, not like other human beings, right? Like, yeah. And a new class of human or type of human that has never existed before and that she wants to sort of usher in um, and not like anyone else at all, which, you know, that hyper individualism is fascinating, I think, to see in like clothing, right? To like, you can immediately mark that's a Wollstonecraft going down the streets, <laughs> the very unfeminine, you know, as people would uh, criticize her for being. So mm. I love that one. Um, and then I also want to ask you, Andy, because Wollstonecraft's legacy is so complicated it was so you know interesting uh and I wanted to ask you just what how how would you sum up like Wollstonecraft's legacy in um you know right after she passes away in the 1790s and early 1800s versus how we think of her today often in scholarship this is another big question I'm gonna I'm gonna give myself time to think about it what by by pointing out that Elena in the in the chat says about the um the Joseph Johnson Mary Wollstonecraft relationship. It sounds like a supervisor PhD supervisee relationship, which I, mm. which I enjoy. That sort of like reverse psychology prodding is is definitely something I need to think of. Like Emma, Emma, who's one of my PhD students, beware. Um, this is <laughs> this is what we'll we'll experiment with you. Um, so I wrote a whole book about her um, reputation just after she um, died, uh, which is sort of like which was complicated, right? So the 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 standard narrative is that. Um, she dies, her grieving uh, widower, William Godwin, writes a, a very, like, a sort of rawly honest and candid um, biography uh, of her, of her, and and that kind of provokes a, a, a right-wing attack on William Godwin, but also on, like, the memory of, um, uh, of Wollstonecraft and, and sort of sullies her reputation you know, for at least the the first half of the the nineteenth century, and then then you know she's sort of rediscovered um, as um, sort of the a, a movement, a, a political movement for women's rights, sort of develops at the end of the nineteenth century, and then it, into the twentieth century, and and sort of the 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 women's suffrage movement, and and so on. Uh, and my the the book I wrote, Wollstonecraft's Ghost. Um, the fate of the female philosopher in the Romantic period um, looks again at especially the, the the immediate response to the memoirs, but also uh, Mary Wollstonecraft's um, posthumous writings, and then how that sort of starts to reshape her um, her legacy, uh, especially amongst um, women writers, and especially in. Um, women's novels so one of the reviews of the book says that it shouldn't be called it shouldn't have been called the romantic period it should have been called in romantic novels uh, a, a reviewer's comment that has haunted me ever since because it like I mainly do talk about um novels but in those novels written by women in the late 1790s and into the early part of the 19th century there's a much more kind of complex and you know often sympathetic reckoning um with Wollstonecraft's writing uh where they're you know they're trying to 
think about ways in which she's talking about education and she's talking about um, sort of women's rights for those women's rights to that sort of highly individualized streak that was in her in, in, in ways that sort of imagine like alternative ways of of of, of recuperating Wollstonecraft in, in in the very early 19th century so there's a sort of way of looking at her legacy which sort of continued that, that continues as this sort of like sometimes troubling but all, all, often usually very inspirational figure from that late 18th century context all the way through to now when like a couple of years ago a, a very controversial um statue was 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 made for Mary Wollstonecraft rather than off Mary Wollstonecraft it looks like a sort of a kind of sci-fi nightmare with a naked woman on the top so it got it it had a lot of it had a lot of criticism directed at it which but I would say Wollstonecraft would probably have enjoyed for the for mm -hmm. the sake of stirring up Mm -hmm. it for want of a better word nice <laughs> yeah thank you I, I just yeah and I want to draw attention to that because I feel like she's so you know she's such an inspiration to so many people today but like when I was reading um contemporary reviews of Mariah the book that she didn't finish uh and then you know uh Godwin published with her notes attached one of the reviewers was saying that it was inspired by the devil like the whole thing <laughs> Just very outright, you know, uh, discrediting her, which is a, Mariah is a fascinating book. We'll look into some of it, but um, it's one of I think the only 18th century novel that I've seen that references like abortion in, in the word explicitly, you know. And I think that's what the reviewer was calling attention to. <laughs> it was very, very pointed. Um, but thank you. So uh, that's a little bit about Mary Wollstonecraft. So you may also be wondering um, why are we talking about breasts? Um, and I've written or been studying. A breastfeeding in the romantic period for a little while now i have yet to hear anyone complain or say they don't want to talk about breasts <laughs> but if you're curious about you know how we got here um some of the important like things i wanted to touch on was um first of all uh the rise of what i'm going to just call origin narratives in uh the 19th century uh, the 18th and 19th century basically with the decline of religious explanation or religious power in society and the rise of like imperialism and colonization and scientific thinking people are sort of thinking about you know where do we come from and especially how how do we explain difference um so there are a lot of texts about how how do we define humans and who can like define our place in the world. So there's scientists, philosophers and physicians and I think I would say even poets, I think romantic poetry romantic poetry's interest in the child figure has to do with describing where did I come from as an individual with you know subjective thoughts and stuff. I think that this is similar like it fits into this origin idea of you know where where do we come from? And for me, one of the most important um, examples of this is the invention of the taxonomic term mammal in 1757. That's a very explicit turn to like, where do we come from? Well, we are we are a species defined by the breast and defined by our relationship to breasts. And a lot of these scientists, philosophers, physicians are going back to the breast and breastfeeding as a way to explain, you know, what makes us human. Um, and another, like, another important place that breasts are, are figuring in the, uh, late 18th and early 19th century is in, uh, medical texts. So the medicalization basically of infant care means that the breast becomes like a s object of study in science. Um, and as probably all of us know, infant mortality rates were really, really bad <laughs> in the 18th century, um, partially like as, the stereotype, you know, historically is that, you know, rich women don't breastfeed, they use wet nurses. So wet nursing always means a lower infant mortality or uh, less chance that the baby will survive. And as like, you know, wealthy women are breastfeeding and then with industrialization becoming uh, more widespread, that means that working class women are also not breastfeeding because they're working these horribly long hours in factories instead. So the middle, the working class is also like losing infants. And even that means like people who have absolutely no money and no food are largely like caring for babies um, that are really not surviving. So uh, basically that's why like medicine 
says that there's this huge problem with you know infant care which there was but unfortunately that is often manifested with like horrible sexism and saying actually women are the problem um not these social factors so one really famous physician william cadigan whose text an essay upon nursing and the management of children it gets circulated you know throughout the 18th century but he he says like the very first line of his tract says, it is with great pleasure I see at last the preservation of children become the care of men of sense. <laughs> In my opinion, this business has been too long fatally left to the management of women who cannot be supposed to have proper knowledge to fit them for such a task. <laughs> So, uh, you know, met the medicalization of infant care hyper focuses on the breast and in parentheses sexism and misogyny uh, and, uh, you know, but the infant mortality rates were really bad and child care in general was pretty, pretty rough. Um, this is like a fascinating topic, so I couldn't throw everything at, at in this slide but uh like for example like people thought that colostrum was bad for infants um and so when a baby was first born like some of the typical things you do is like immediately separate the mother and baby and you'd give the infant baby like a piece of pork fat to suck on <laughs> just like <laughs> so bad like right on so many levels so you know the sexism is certainly not justified, but the concern for infant care certainly is. But uh, so there's a medicalization of the breast and of like breastfeeding, um, right, that like involves analyzing breasts and dissecting breasts, especially when it comes to breast cancer and operating on breasts and anatomizing like what is the breast and it becomes a sort of biological object. And then the third thing I want to touch on, which Andy uh, brought up, was the French Revolution. Um, and breastfeeding as like this this painting kind of suggests uh breasts sort of became this standard for an ideology around going back to nature so as you can tell like the men are contributing uh their guns and they're participating in violence for the revolution but the women are just showing their breasts and that's how they they're like turning society around right is uh with breastfeeding um and one of my favorite little anecdotes about um revolutionary or the french revolution and breastfeeding is that uh one of robespierre's like upper associates his name was labasse I, I don't know how to pronounce it in french so sorry everyone for that <laughs> but the confidence. last what was that say it with confidence and we'll believe you okay oh good uh, but like his last words to his wife as he's being carried to like to execution were about his infant son and he said to his wife nourish him with your own milk inspire in him the love of his country right that like just totally encapsulates the idea that nursing is like a civic duty it's a sign that you know the family supports egalitarian politics if the woman is breastfeeding right so it becomes a really like a lot of different disciplines and topics are all sort of honing in on the breast in this time period um so you know you might be wondering also like why wollstonecraft's breasts right if she's this you know... go, go back to the, go back to the, the, oh. the, the this slide i have so many questions about this before oh, we yeah, yeah. Okay. um because i i love that idea i, I love the idea that the poets have this this part to play in in origin narratives and i know i think you've worked on or, or are working on like wordsworth and i wondered if you could talk a little, like obviously there's there's a famous line with Wordsworth about the child is, you know, the child is father to the father to the man, which is from the immortality ode, which is which is think about origins. But I think you've worked on like Wordsworth and breastfeeding a little bit as well, haven't you? Yes. Yes, um, because the prelude, which if you haven't read it yet, you absolutely should. All 13 books, one of my favorites. I, I love the prelude. Um, but uh, we we summarize the prelude now as like, you know, it's the growth of the poet's mind, right? And in book two of the prelude, when Word, Wordsworth is like, how did I become a poet? Well, let's think back to when I was an infant being breastfed. <laughs> and he goes back to like, and you know, he can't remember this physically, right? So he's imagining where did I come from as a poet and he is imagining well I was breastfed you know even though as an orphan like probably that's part of it right is his parents dying when he's relatively young is like recuperating that story for himself uh, and that relationship he says you know where does poetry come from well the poetic spirit happens when a baby is resting on his mother's breast 
Um, and it's their when the mother is breastfeeding and they're making eye contact, the mother and baby. And by that relationship, he's sort of absorbing this stuff like emotion and sympathy and becoming a human being instilled with like love and hope and joy just from like that moment and then a poet can go on and like remember that relationship and create it you know later when he's writing poetry and trying he is like a breastfeeding mother because he's trying to recreate sympathy you know in his readers does that answer enough i could talk about that forever as you probably know <laughs> It's a, it's such it's such it's such an interesting image, right? And I think it sort of it sets up some stuff for for Wollstonecraft thinking about the the you know the origins of like right the relationship between writing and and motherhood and the 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 breast is 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 going to be so important for her. I have I have another question which I think links like your point two and point three the the medicalization of infant care and that sort of that relationship you were talking about in the French Revolution between like motherhood and, and nationhood, which I think is like a really important, like that's a, a, a bit that is important about these discussions about in about breastfeeding, right? Like I think like one of the arguments that gets made in the 18th century is that, that it should be, there's a discussion about whether or not it should be mothers who breastfeed or whether it should be like babies should be farmed out to wet nursing. And one of one of the arguments for like mother's role is is that it has that sort of relationship with 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 nationhood, right? It's that that the children, it's almost like children learn patriotism from from breastfeeding. Is that is that true, or am I making that up? No, no, no. That's definitely true. Yes, um, which is like partly where Wollstonecraft in, comes in, saying, "Well, if you want your you know infants to be your families to be patriots, then you have to make sure that like the mother like." is a fully participating you know person citizen of the the nation right if she gets sort of relegated or pushed to the side that's when you have issues with breastfeeding and issues with society so yeah absolutely and i think rousseau argues that really really clearly that like if you i, I what does he say if you want nature to reawaken and like reanimate society it has to start with breastfeeding and with like the family just yeah. yeah. So, so that's one way. Like R R Wollstonecraft has this really weird relationship with Rousseau, where, doesn't she? Where she's like she's she's partially inspired by him and then partially infuriated. Yes, partly repulsed. And I think part of that has to do with I think she would have a similar relationship with Wordsworth had she, you know, been able to read the prelude, because so many of the men writing about it are talking about absorbing the things from the mother. And Wollstonecraft is like, what about the mother as a subject? Right. She's creating these things. They don't just happen. Like <laughs> breastfeeding doesn't just happen. Like now we know that today, but that's like she's trying to talk about like this is something that like a, a woman has to intentionally cultivate and make possible, right? And she needs resources to do that. Fab. So that... Now, we're, now, now we're on to Wollstonecraft. So we now can go. Kind of yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that, and I, I kind of got into a little bit, but in her life and in her death, Wollstonecraft was like really interested in breastfeeding and it comes up in a lot of her works. Um, so in uh, the thoughts on the education of daughters, which was her first published um, book, she uses breastfeeding as an example of like rational affection. So, and I think that's where she pushes back against Rousseau is when Rousseau is saying, well, if, if women breastfeed, then nature has this power. And Wollstonecraft is saying, actually, when women breastfeed, they are like, using their emotional uh or they're using like a, they're thinking rationally about how to use emotions to make human sympathy happen in their families and that's what's going to do good for society is you know if people love each other in their families right um and and in a personal like letter uh, about her daughter Fanny she wrote that Fanny when she's breastfeeding right Fanny begins to suck so manfully that her father George Imlay reckons saucily on her writing the second part of the rights of woman <laughs> which I love and I know that's a really famous quote I see it pop up everywhere but I I don't see many people break it down but it's a fascinating one because like 
first of all, she's like linking breastfeeding, not just with Fanny's future authorship, right? And seeing that if Fanny like is a good, you know, is a baby that's really good at nursing, that somehow like, I think it's implied that she is like taking part of Wollstonecraft in her, right? And that's like a really, really common belief in the 19th, 18th and 19th centuries about breastfeeding. To, to the point where, like, I don't, I can't see anyone watching, so I don't know if there are any redheads, but my husband's a redhead, and I, I told him this, that people explicitly said, do not hire a redhead woman as a wet nurse, because their tempers are too fiery, so if you <laughs> are breastfed by a redhead, you will just become, you know, this angry monster baby, um, and, uh, like, I think Wollstonecraft is, like, playing into that a little bit, and saying, you know, because Fanny is so actively taking a part of my body into her, that, like, she will be able to write the second parts of the rights of woman, right, even though breastfeeding is not certainly a prerequisite for good writing, or, you know, Wollstonecraft's politics, but I think it does uh, come up there, and the implication that, like, Fanny being good at nursing, you know, she's sort of transcending, um, something about you know being a baby girl right she sucks manfully uh she has like some sort of manly power as an infant that's manifested by her breastfeeding which is you know so so weird it's an odd image and, right so like sucking sucking manfully has that like has like needs some unpacking or maybe like people don't want to unpack it but then she oh, they did they did yeah. want to unpack it. <laughs> well, I mean, yes, yeah, so and co contemporary today, people today don't really want to unpack it. But in 18th century writings, especially, it kind of goes away in the 19th century, and especially like the cult of domesticity calms this image down quite a bit. But there's a lot, a lot of text about you know infant boys nursing from their mothers, and there's a weird talk about like flirtation between them <laughs> like that's the word they choose not mine <laughs> that's uh, how I would say it but there is like there's like a weirdly quasi incestuous sexual relationship that's you know imposed on mother infant maybe that's part of why women didn't want to breastfeed in this time period this is a little creepy <laughs> mm. and to say that. In, in the like the more I think about that quote the more interesting it is because it's obviously got like it's a family it's a family picture right that the Wollston, Wollstonecraft is breastfeeding Fanny in front of Imlay or or you know with Imlay involved in a way that he can he can saucily like make a joke about her writing this book right there there there's sort of there's there's double there's double flirtations going on in the in that she's imagining she's imagining Fanny as a kind of man and and she's also you know Imlay's also flirting with her in this in this sort of scene yeah. Yeah. Wollstonecraft writes about like that. Uh, I don't know, like what triad little group uh, mm. uh, quite a bit in um, education of daughters and in the vindication, um, because apparently a lot of women in the 19th century didn't want to breastfeed because their husbands thought it was gross. Um, so vindication uses the argument that like, first of all, breastfeeding should, you know, create and expand on this rational affection for women but a husband watching should also like develop a rational affection towards their family as well um and and she comments on that uh and i think part of the implication is that uh women need the education and discipline and you know confidence to breastfeed and also like to stand up to their husbands i think is what it's also saying like they need to have they need to feel like they can say no i'm going to breastfeed even if you don't want me to um because that's what's rational right and they become like a sort of leader in their family in ways that you know are not really culturally acceptable mm. so it, yeah i love that quote i think it's fascinating um and then you know but what's really fascinating as you might be thinking as you look at the slides breastfeeding puppies what is the deal there? Um, well, when Wollstonecraft gave birth to Mary, um, she did not pass the placenta. Uh, I think the current like or modern take is that the placenta probably broke apart, um, and that's what caused an infection, and that is why Wollstonecraft died. Um, but in the 18th century, physicians thought that what they called childbed fever, now we just know it's sepsis, um, or we, we can call it a postpartum infection, uh, 18th century physicians believe that infections uh, in, you know, during birth were caused by milk, basically like leaking 
backwards into the body. So I will tell you all like the disgusting um, idea of what, where they, what do they think is going on? So they, the 18th century physicians would say, so it's, it's the spilling of the milk into the cavity of the lower abdomen instead of mounting to the breast. Then the milk goes sour in a few hours. The intestines are swollen and covered with red inflammation and the spilled milk is found to turn into cheese, a quantity of two hatfuls at least. <laughs> Which like the two hatfuls, I feel like is the cherry on top. Like what were they measuring? Why does someone like they're dissecting a woman's body and they take their hats off? Like it looks like two hatfuls. And now we know today that what they were looking at was probably pus because breast milk in the body does not turn to cheese. Spoiler alert. <laughs> but uh, I think that that image of her death is so important because it, it means that people thought that milk, basically, milk gone astray is what killed Mary Wollstonecraft, who was trying to rationally unsex women and say, hey, you know, they are not just women, right? They're human beings, right? So um, physicians, and the, the breastfeeding puppies part comes from, um, since they thought that the milk was the problem, not the, you know, not, not the placenta. They thought, you know, she needs to get that milk out of her body as soon as possible, but Mary cannot, Mary, you know, Junior cannot drink that milk or it will poison her. Uh, so they, you know, got puppies, they brought puppies to her breasts to latch so that they would draw off the milk, which is not as bizarre as it sounds. That's not an unheard of practice. Um, and they could also use lambs. That was common uh, for this sort of issue. Um, and uh, one critical or one scholar, Cynthia Richards, when she was summarizing like uh, Wollstonecraft's death and the reaction to it, one of Wollstonecraft's, you know, big uh, haters, I don't know what the <laughs> staunch opposers uh, wrote that uh, when he heard about Mary Wollstonecraft's death and how she died, he said, Richard Paul Wheel, he said uh, that he saw the hand of providence in her death. Um because she died a death that strongly marked the distinction of the sexes by pointing out the destiny of women and the diseases to which they are liable, right? So Paul Wheel thought that Wollstonecraft's life and philosophy were extremely offensive to modesty and decency. Uh, and just like Wollstonecraft had gone astray, the milk went astray and killed her, right? So... They were seeing poetic justice, which is really quite a bummer, but it, it is a fascinating part of her death that I think it, it, it's wild how that intersects with breastfeeding um, so poignantly. Um, do you I was have really, any questions? Just any before we, we, we moved on, I was going to, like, Paul Wheel, uh, it reminded me, talking about Paul Wheel, that he, I think, I think he's the one that describes Wollstonecraft as a as an Am as an Amazon, right? He, he, he imagines her as a sort of Amazon with a band of like warrior woman, women threatening the nation be behind her. So it's sort of another, another link to the breast, I suppose. That it's um, he's imagining her as someone who, like you know, so a, a warrior who would who would who would cut off the breast to to allow for archery. It, 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 that's what that's what happens with Amazon. Yes, yeah. The idea was that if they cut off the breast, they'll have like better blood flow to the shoulder and like more strength in the arm. I I think. Yeah, but yeah, just like it, it, it's a like Paul Will often, often Paul Will Paul Will's still famous today. If he is famous today, mainly as an as, as mainly as an a hater of Wollstonecraft, isn't he? he that's where mm -hmm. that's that's where he still gets commented commented upon. So he's like a a little parasite on her on <laughs> on her fame in a way. Like I uh, I was just gonna I was gonna say to the audience that that Kayla said, do, should I talk about the the milk into cheese? <laughs> Things it's disgusting, and I was like, "Yes, we we will keep the audience awake with this horrible, <laughs> like, like nightmarish vision of of what's happened in, okay, in well, bodies." I need to add to that though. In our correspondence, you said yes to milk cheese, <laughs> and you clarified, but not as a you know gourmet delicacy. Yes to bringing it up, <laughs> that, that is what <laughs> which is almost <laughs> more disturbing than the quote. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, yeah, two hatfuls, you have to wonder what they did with it, right? Very disturbing. That is horrible. We yeah. should move on now.
Okay, okay, okay. So uh, that's sort of like breastfeeding in, you know, the 18th and 19th century is why it's important. Why was it important to Wollstonecraft? And then today, uh, it's still like quite uh, prominent in discussions of feminism and in literature. Um, so one of the ways that it like is important to my research is uh, in Helen C. Sue's essay, The Laugh of the Medusa, which was published in 1976. Um, and this has stuck with me since I first read it, you know, probably 10 years ago, but it's where Sisu conceptualizes the woman writer as one who, um, quote, always has within her at least a little of that good mother's milk. She writes in white ink. And Sisu's like, you know, link between breastfeeding and creativity, uh, I think was fascinating because like, first of all, if a woman writes with her breast milk, like metaphorically, well, white ink cannot be seen on like white paper, right? That we usually write in. And, and I think part of that is a commentary about women's writing existing in a, in a patriarchal society. Um, but it also is very like essential, essentializing, uh, you know, productivity or reproductive like repro what's the word for that reproductivity with like authorship which a lot of women you know would not agree with uh, and don't want to be associated like who who wants to write in white ink that sounds kind of gross and uncomfortable and, and painful um and sisu is also like the idea of white ink is also kind of making women's writing inherently transgressive in the sense that like i'm not using this milk for my infant anymore i'm using it for like to, to express my own subjectivity. And I think that is, you know, fair um, for a lot of writers, but there are plenty who, you know, plenty of women writers who don't see authorship as transgressive, right? And don't see motherhood as transgressive, right? Uh, it's partly Wollstonecraft, I think, has a weird sort of in the middle, like in some ways she's certainly pushing back against stereotypes of women writers, but in others, like what she's saying is that especially in vindication and you can correct me andy if i get this wrong but she seems to be very much like women should get married and women should have kids and women should also be writing and expressing themselves but it's you know ultimately a different way to uphold a existing order right she's i mean she, she's kind of, like in the vindication at least she's sort of vexed on on the question of marriage because she thinks like because the current state of marriage is 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 one of sort of inequality so she's sort of after she's she's ma she's making a set of arguments about how women like women need to be invested with more authority in the family and they mm -hmm. and therefore like the current state of of marriage is one of um like you know, one of inequality and in, in, in justice and that has an effect on the woman but it also has an effect on the man in that it turns him into a tyrant and it has an effect on the children in that they see they they sort of see and then perpetuate the the abuse that is that that, that is going on so that that sort of she she's kind of like she's against the current status of marriage but she's sort of for she she kind of wants a better a better society based in a in, in that sort of in that sort of family, that family matrix where which has women on a on a much more equal footing with, with man, she's sort of saying the way the way marriages, the way society currently works, and the and the way marriage currently works, kind of um, bakes in inequality and injustice and kind of a, abuse and tyranny all the way down. So that, that there needs to be a a realignment of of men's and women's roles in order for in order for children to to grow up to be properly like citizen proper citizens i suppose and then that that will have that will change the way society currently currently bakes in that inequality to to make a more uh, what she sees as a more rational but then also a, like a more progressive and a more equal and equitable um yeah way of um way of making society yeah yeah <clears throat> Yeah, and I, I and I ask specifically part because I think that like the idea of white ink, like I kind of think Wollstonecraft might take issue with that. That like she was writing, you know, long before she 
uh, was pregnant or gave birth. And yet, as we'll talk about in Mariah on the next slide, uh, she also associates uh, authorship and uh, breast milk and breastfeeding, you know, in a pretty linked way. Um, but breastfeeding is also like still very important to discussions of like progressive ideals of gender, like so I don't know if this was a big deal um, for you guys, but it was a big deal, at least for where I live. A lot of people were talking about the term chest feeding that uh, came into circulation about five years ago, I think it was. Um, some people found that really offensive uh, and thought that like people were trying to erase the idea of breastfeeding. But it was basically a term to try and be just more inclusive to how people feel about their bodies. And if they don't like the term breast and they want to use something more neutral, they could say chest feeding instead of breastfeeding. Um, so we like as a you know society today still look to breasts and breastfeeding as a way to talk through and work through sexual difference, right? And uh and when I read texts written in, you know, the late 18th, 18th century and early 19th century, or like even Wordsworth, right, who wants to recreate breastfeeding for his readers, um, I I always want to tell people that like breasts were never a stable sign of, of difference <laughs> because Wordsworth is saying, I'm a breastfeeding man <laughs> and I'm doing it through my text, right? And I'm transcending, you know, my gender. But that's a, there are a lot of ways that breastfeeding is talked about, still related to um uh related to femininity and feminism and you know rights related to gender and sexuality um that I couldn't fit on the slide. But those are things that I think about in the back of my mind when I'm doing my research. Um, but I know I'm like probably rambling a little bit too long, so I'll jump right no, to. No, no, I, I'm still making you a bet because we've got a, oh, we've had a couple of questions, which we and it's I think it'd be a good time to sort of take these before we do. We we might end with a bit of close reading. So we're, we've got okay. a question from Laura, and she had another one earlier about the fascinating discussion about white ink and writing. What are some of the differences between discourses of milk and blood in romantic discourses on childbirth and or writing? This is this is coming from Laura as a um, as a sort of vampire scholar, I think. She, Laura, Laura's able to unmute herself. And, no, uh, I am uh, here, on. in fact. Yeah. Cool. Katie, this is fascinating. I, I'm just finding this. I'm, I'm a Victorianist thinking about some similar things. But yeah, I just wondered if, if this idea about white ink this idea of milk, I'm thinking about substance um, imagery, basically, are there similarities or, you know, childbirth is a process connected with with blood and, and milk and do those discourses overlap or are they very different either about revolutionary values or whatever? <laughs> yeah, I think that they do overlap and some of the ways are, are kind of gross. So I'm sorry, like that I'll bring them up now. But um, so for example, um, people people believed that breast milk for a long time people believed that breast milk came from basically period blood that was stored up in the body for the nine months of pregnancy and that's not the gross part though uh and then like that that was manifest through like breast milk which was essentially white blood and then where i think it gets kind of gross is like when byron in child harold's pilgrimage is talking about breastfeeding imagery and then he moves to like talking about um, semen and creation. And he, because people also believe that semen was like blood turned white from the body. And he like tries to make this connection between breastfeeding and semen. That's a little disturbing <laughs> in my opinion, but that's, you know, all things Byron. So there is, I think, like a, a connection between like, where does, where, where does, what happens to blood basically. And there's obviously like a long history, right? Of like um, the pen as a penis, right? And like writing as like sexual difference. So yes, they intersect. Um, and now I'm like losing my train of thought with like bringing up like these very controversial images that probably no one wanted to hear. <laughs> no, that is that is genuinely fascinating and feels very on brand for Byron. It's very on brand for Byron. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, like- Thank you for that. Yeah, I 
yeah, the, there's a lot. I think Child Herod's Pilgrimage has a whole section about there's so there's a there's a story called Roman Charity. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's yeah. So the idea that, you know, a young woman who has an infant, so she's breastfeeding, goes to visit her father in prison and he's dying. So she breastfeeds him. And Byron says that because she's breastfeeding her father, it's like this cycle of like he contributed something to her, the creation of her life. And now he is contributing. She is contributing back to her father something to his life and it's like this cyclical image of like blood turning into a bodily fluid turning back into blood turning back into a bodily fluid basically forever which i don't think was the point of the story of roman charity i'll just say <laughs> to just call byron out there of course that's the image that he goes to but uh yeah i think uh it, it is very linked um and i'm sure you've seen like in vampire um studies there's often like um in some imagery there's like a vampire who's biting very near the breast so like they are drinking the blood that like kind of represents the new life uh through breastfeeding mm -hmm. so it's like the you know damnable version of breastfeeding and at yeah. least in american literature there were some ideas about like witches would breastfeed from satan and it was actually blood instead of milk <laughs> Me, I'm sure me, Mina Harker get like breastfeeds from Dracula. Or am I making that? Yeah, up? she's and she's described as as a, like having her head forced to drink his blood, like a kitten drinking milk. And mm. Carmilla as well, obviously drinks from the child. Um, so yeah, all these different, all these different exciting fluids overlapping. Metaphoric and that's sort of, and that's, that's a brilliant kind of, answer. The sort of transgressiveness and sort of per, per, that it's like sort of perverse breastfeeding isn't it in, in in various ways there's another question from Absolutely. jackie who, say, who says hi to kayla from byui and it's about um caroline walker bynum's book jesus as mother um not about mary wollstonecraft per se but about medieval artworks portrayal of jesus as nursing his disciples i think it's, yeah. it's more of a it's more of a suggestion than a question but that it sort of gets us to from from that we, we've gone from dracula to jesus but we, we've got <laughs> a similar imagery of, of the man breastfeeding i suppose yes now like instead of the like e the you know sort of darkly transcendent breastfeeding there's like the holy transcendent <laughs> breastfeeding and imagery yeah there are there is quite a bit the well the medieval i'm not like a medievalist i have studied a little bit of breastfeeding in the medieval period and it's it's quite interesting and exciting there's a there's a lot to be said i think but yeah the disciples are often uh, depicted as sucking blood from the wound of christ on, on his side um or breastfeeding and and um there's a lot of imagery of like breastfeeding that gets sort of mixed in with text. So I can't remember the name of the saint. Um, I will have to look it up, but feel free to email me and I, I can tell you the name. But he had a had a vision of this statue of the Virgin Mary. And in his vision, Mary woke up and she started like squirting milk at him. And the milk like turned into text. And he like learned scripture as he was like, drinking her milk <laughs> so there's a lot there's a lot there of like uh breastfeeding becoming something more about teaching and uh yeah i know that's not really like jesus it, breastfeeding. It, it's almost it's almost literally back to white ink right that the the, the 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 milk becomes scripture there, there there's the, it's back to sisu that's also takes us to a question that emma has helpfully put in the q a um, she sort of compliments you on an amazing talk uh, and, and is also asking about ink. Uh, perhaps maybe we can see the white ink and therefore breastfeeding as the unwritten slash hidden domestic labour that women do, especially when raising children, etc. There is often an unequal and hidden division of labour done by mothers. So that, that, I think that's a sort of like a, a wider question about what the, the role that white ink can can play in our thinking about breastfeeding, I suppose. Yeah, I, I think that's what Sisu is getting at. I mean, when I was sharing her 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 quote, I am a little bit critical of it, but I think that's exactly what she's saying is that it's invisible and and it shouldn't be, right? And it's visible, I think, to other women, I think is what she also wants to get at. That if you have a reading strategy for understanding women's writing, then you can read the white ink that is written that people mm. 
believe is there, right? That they look at a blank page and say, you know, women have never contributed to writing. They're not real writers, whatever. But Sisu is saying, if you know how to read it, it's there and it's valuable. And it's a really deep, intimate expression of, you know, who a woman is. So, uh, I, yeah, I absolutely agree with that that reading. Excellent. So there, there, there's a there, there's a sort of there's a request for references from from Sabano, um, to know about the the breast milk cheese bit. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I got. But we we could we could talk. We we might we'll, we'll come back to that. We I, there was a question about what you thought about the Mary Wollstonecraft statue, which we might end up with. But I know you you you've picked a bit from um, Mariah or the Wrongs of Woman for us to sort of do do a little bit of close reading about. So it might be nice to look at. It, this is a way of looking at white ink in 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 practice, right? This is like about work, about women's writing and how it, and what Wollstonecraft is thinking about it. So let's let's go to the next slide. And, yeah. And so this is. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go on, you. No, I was just saying we're getting towards a climax. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah. So Mariah uh, or the Wrongs of Woman starts with uh, like this little paragraph about Mariah basically waking up and she's she's been kidnapped. And she's thinking right away about her infant baby and thinking about breastfeeding. So she says, her infant's image was continually floating on Mariah's sight. And the first smile of intelligence remembered as none but a mother, an unhappy mother can conceive. She heard her half speaking, half cooing and felt the little twinkling fingers on her burning bosom, a bosom bursting with the nutriment uh, for which this child, child might now be pining in vain. Um, so she starts the rest of the paragraph. She's like wondering what's going to happen to her infant um, because, you know, a wet nurse cannot do the same job that Mariah can do in caring for her child. And I think like part of the subtext is also like, what's Mariah going to do? Because she's in pain because she needs to breastfeed. She feels physically in pain and uncomfortable and she's burning. Right. She's just not really sure what to do. Um, it doesn't really address uh, uh, the like physical thing that Mariah might have done to like relieve her pain but uh she does talk about in her, her imprisonment what is mariah doing like to sort of pass the time um it says that she endeavored to soothe by reading the anguish of her wounded mind her thoughts would often wander from the subject she was led to discuss and tears of maternal set uh, maternal tenderness obscured the reasoning page um and the first chapter ends with sort of setting up this like what is mariah going to do she cannot breastfeed her baby she wants to be with her baby uh and she can't read and the solution is, here's, I think, where we see the white ink. Writing, then, was the only alternative. And she wrote some rhapsodies descriptive of the state of her mind. But the events of her past life pressing on her, she resolved circumstantially to relate them with the sentiments that experience and more matured reason would naturally suggest. They might perhaps instruct her daughter and shield her from the misery, the tyranny her mother knew not how to avoid. This thought gave life to her diction, her soul flowed into it, and she soon found the task of recollecting almost obliterated impressions very interesting. She lived again in the revived emotions of youth and forgot her present in the retrospect of sorrows that had assumed an unalterable character. So like, in, instead of being able to breastfeed, uh, and we didn't really talk about the connection between education educating daughters and breastfeeding, although that's there historically. Um, but what Mariah can do instead is put her soul like flowing out from her bosom right into the page and instead teach her daughter on the white page. So the ink is not physically white, but it is metaphorically white as it can represent like the release um, and the, the connection to her daughter that she can't have physically. And she write that it she in some in Mariah we get the the some of the stories that she writes to her her unborn daughter don't don't we there's there, there's that sort of so it's it's like we're getting it's it's like us as readers get to read the 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 white ink of Mariah from her from her prison cell. Yes, absolutely. And I think the hope is that we as the readers will suck so manfully from Mariah that Mariah is literally like supposed to be the fictional ver like sequel to The Vindication, right? And yeah. we are supposed to love it so much that like we're going to imbue like the characteristics of Wollstonecraft and understand her politics in our own lives. So like by sort of watching the breastfeeding happen on the page, we are like, you know, vicariously feeding from Wollstonecraft um, and hopefully, you know, learn something from what she's saying. 
Perfect. I think that's a, that, that that brings us sort of perfectly towards an end. Do we have? Do did you have a reference for the the um the breast milk teas bit? Yes, it's uh the book is called The History of Childbirth by uh Jack Jacuus Gellis. I don't know how to pronounce it. I could type it in the chat, I guess. Type it in the chat. There we go. And I think it was published in ninety six, maybe. And Emma, you don't need to apologize for your general statement. I thought it, I, I thought it was a great question. It definitely had a question mark in there. Yeah, yeah, you're fine. There we go. Jack Dellis, The History of Childbirth. Fantastic. And when what, we've got two minutes left, Kayla. What did, did you you've seen the 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 weird statue that um they made of they made for Wollstonecraft, not of Wollstonecraft. What mm -hmm. did you what did you think of that? I wish there was like, you know, milk dripping from her breasts or something. <laughs> <laughs> they should have, like basically your answer is they should have gone more weird yeah obviously that's always the answer <laughs> uh yeah i i'm not I, I didn't have any problems with it i don't really know what could be upsetting about it uh unless people just find you know naked women upsetting but uh it seemed cool to me but not you know not related to what i study so i'm not an expert on it for sure that was good. No, I I think more 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 weird more. It should be sort of like it it should it, it should excrete milk is a is a yes. great um yes. would be a great addition. I think that's well, sort of, we need to write to the Wollstonecraft Society. Like the, you know, don't worry don't worry about this statue. We should have we should make it. We should we should sort of link it up so it becomes a a, a water feature. Yes. Well, you know, like, and I I I've talked to you about this, but one of my the. French Revolution things that I could have mentioned is that they literally, I think it was to, it was to celebrate the Bastille Day, like the first one, I think, like to commemorate. And from the ruins of the Bastille, they created a giant statue of a woman with two breasts that was literally a fountain and it would squirt water out of one breast and wine out of the other. And the people, like the leaders of the revolution went up and like commemorated the day by drinking from the fountain. <laughs> so, I, you know, it's it's there. The, the inspiration's there. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I'm going to give you, I, I'll, I'll give you a round of applause because that was a great, I think that was a great talk and really, really like, like food, food for thought, as you, you might be able to say. And I'm going to stop recording. Thank you.